Hello, everyone, and welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is John Darcy. I'm the Managing Director of SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum and networking platform at the intersection of finance, technology, and public policy. SALT Talks are a digital interview series with leading investors, creators, and thinkers. And our goal on these SALT Talks is the same as our goal at our SALT Conference series, which is to provide a window into the mind of subject matter experts as well as provide a platform for what we think are big ideas that are shaping the future. And we're very excited today to welcome Jeffrey Ubbin to Salt Talks, somebody who uh, both is investing and making a lot of money uh, for his clients over his long track record, as well as driving social impact and increasingly so uh, in his latest ventures. But uh, I'll read you a little bit more about Jeff's background, but he's a man who needs no introduction. Uh, Jeffrey Ubbin is the founder and managing partner of Inclusive Capital Partners, uh, Mr. Ubbin began his investing career at Fidelity Investments, where he worked alongside legendary investor Peter Lynch and ran the Fidelity Value Fund. The Value Fund's assets under management grew more than tenfold uh, during Ubbin's tenure as portfolio manager. In the year 2000, after five years at Blum Capital in San Francisco, Mr. Ubbin founded Value Act Capital and pioneered concentrated active value investing. During almost 17 years as the sole portfolio manager of the uh, VAC flagship fund, assets under management grew from approximately 65 million to more than 15 billion. Uh, when portfolio manager at VAC, uh, Mr. Ubbin served on more than uh, 15 public company boards and generated net annual returns of 15%. And over that same time period, the S&P 500's annualized return uh, was about 5%. So dramatic outperformance there. At Inclusive Capital, or NCAP, uh, Mr. Ubbin seeks to make long-term equity investments in companies while working actively with managements and boards to responsibly and creatively address environmental and societal problems. Uh, Mr. Ubbin serves on the boards of Duke University, the World Wildlife Fund, the Nature Conservancy, uh, Conservancy's Nature Vest, and the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation. He has a bachelor's degree from Duke University, and as someone who grew up in Durham but likes a lighter shade of blue, I won't hold that one against you, Jeff. Uh, he also has an MBA from the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University. And hosting today's talk is Anthony Scaramucci, the founder and managing partner of Skybridge Capital, a global alternative investment firm. Anthony is also the chairman of SALT, and with that, I will turn over to Anthony for the interview. John, thank you. And Jeff, uh, amazing career. You know, it's interesting. Uh, this week, uh, Fidelity Magellan converted to an ETF. Can you imagine that? I mean, <laughs> we're, we're sitting here and uh, you and I grew up in this industry with the legendary Peter Lynch. And of course, you were running the uh, legendary value fund as a mutual fund. Uh, but we seem to have bifurcated now, right? We're going ETF or hedge fund. You know, it's, it's just interesting. We're going to get into it in a second. But before we get there... Uh, tell us where you grew up and what your family and your upbringing was like. Okay, that's a little bit too much me. I'll do it fast. Uh, I grew up in Chicago. I grew up in the business. My dad um, started a, a money management company after leaving Allstate. I think it was in the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, he was a growth investor and the Nifty 50 crashed. And, uh, and I remember that. Uh, it made an impression on me for sure. By the way, by the way, I interned for him during my high school years, and I started calling companies when I was 17. So I've been calling companies for 43 years. <laughs> and brothers and sisters, Jeff? One sister. Okay, so you had a love, you had a love affair then with your dad's business. Uh, you could have probably gone in any direction that you wanted. What attracted you to the money management business? You get paid to learn every day. You come in and, uh, and you fill yourself up with information from some new industry or some new executive. Uh, that, that is almost, uh, that is almost uh, unfair to, to get paid to learn. Uh, so I'm just, you know, if you're intellectually curious, it's the best business in the world times 10. See, I, you and I are total agreement on that. I always tell kids that this is the business of understanding other businesses. So, man, if you love business, you can learn about the insurance business, biotech. You, you pick the business. You can get steeped in it uh, from Wall Street or from the investment management business. 
Tell us about your investment philosophy and your perspective. And what are some of the lessons that you've learned along the way, you know, from your days at Fidelity to where you are now? You know, when you're at Fidelity, you, uh, I was dogged chasing Peter Lynch down. You had mentors like Rich Fenton and it was based, it was just call companies, call companies, call companies. Don't, don't talk to, I don't know, don't talk to other managers even very much. It's all about independent, independent thought um, and, and, and stay away from the herd. Um, it's one of the reasons I, I, I went from Boston to San Francisco, you know, the market opens, the market opens up uh, before I get, I awake. Uh, so I get the last call. Uh, it's like you said, you know, you're, we're in the understanding business, not the information business. So much of money management has moved to the information business to the point where algorithms are not trying to beat the next algorithm to some sort of data point that drives a short-term stock price. Um, and, you know, that, that has commodified this world and, you know, it's short time horizons and there's no transaction costs on stocks, all of which creates an arbitra- time arbitrage that, um, that means the long-term guy can still win, I think. Um, but it's confusing for sure relative to where it was 20, 30 years ago. So you, you started Value you Act, you gave a speech and su- subsequently wrote a letter to your limited partners about organizational culture. And so I'm a very big believer in that, by the way. I think we have the same desks, same phones, same computer terminals, but what separates our businesses is the culture. Uh, Tell us about the culture at Value Act and tell us about uh, why you are so hell bent on organizational culture. Uh, I'm a 100% build your talent guy. Um, I think there's a marketing aspect to to money management where you tend to see people buy resumes or plug holes. I've never done that. I've hired people. I started, I started value act when I was 39 and everybody I basically hired was late twenties, early thirties at the oldest. And so the idea for me is, is um, distribute uh, the equity um, broadly and early Um, um, get uh, no drama and no jump ball around uh, succession. I mean, we're telling companies about management succession and how they should pursue it. We should do it ourselves. Um, get buy-in on the succession plan uh, and then and, and stick to it. And in the end, the pie grows, even though my, my share is shrinking, the pie grows and we get smarter as a team. Well, I, I, I agree with it. It, it, it. It's akin to baseball or football. You know what I mean? You're drafting and building from the inside. You're using a farm system. You're not trying to bring in free agents. If you look at how these championship teams are made, it's all the same. Uh, so I give you a lot, a lot of credit on that. Um, I want to go to the active investing and being an activist. And so, uh, you know, and you're a value investor, obviously. So how is your active investing different from other hedge fund activists. Yeah, in Fidelity, in Fidelity, you would be frustrated with a company's management. You would say, you know, what if you sold this business and focused on your core business? What if you, um, you know, uh, fo- focused on return on capital versus pure growth? Whatever the situation was, they would say, if you don't like what we're doing, you can sell the stock. I mean, that would, I was told that to my face often enough. So we put ACT in the name, Anthony, in 2000, and that was really not a thing. It's hard to, to, to remember because we've come so far. But the idea of an owner in the boardroom that understands how the shareholder thinks has a sense of urgency. And like I said, I'm paid to, to know this company. I mean, nobody else in the room really is paid to, to do their own work on, on the company and on whose board they serve. So I bring new information to the room, all of which seemed to me to be a perfect way to make idiosyncratic return. You become your own catalyst. Um, and, um, you know, it was pretty rich in 2000. There was still a lot of the management primacy era of governance was ending and there was a lot of mismanagement as a result. Um, so 2000, 2010 was very fun. Um, we always focused on putting a principal on the board. We didn't outsource our board work and we, 
really always have had a long-term time horizon, a three to five year time horizon. I thought there was going to be more of that, more practitioners like us. And it turns out the hedge fund activists really shortened up the time horizon. They, they, uh, they, they really shoot for one year quick wins, in my opinion. And that's where the industry has gone too much. Uh, one of the reasons I left, I left the industry, I left the neighborhood, so to speak, and, and, uh, and I started Inclusive. 2013, Value Act takes a 1% stake, $2 billion, 1% stake in Microsoft. Uh, you turn that position into a board seat and you help to put the company back on a sustainable growth pattern. And you and I are old enough to remember Microsoft in the 90s, its initial public offering. It was a roaring stock uh, that sort of flatlined for a period of time. You saw something there. Now that stock is once again in the, the pantheon of uh, Tech Hall of Fame. Tell us about that position. Tell us about your activism there and tell us where things are in Microsoft today. I mean, it was a culminating event for activist investing. Um, we, uh, we actually, to a certain extent, all we really did is rally the shareholders who were ridiculously frustrated with the flat line. Um, and, and we made sure the directors picked up the, the phone when about 25% of the shareholders, maybe it was 10 different shareholders, called them. I mean, there was this disconnect between what the directors thought they could do since there was a dominating founder in the boardroom and he, you know, it was a kind of a traumatizing experience for them. And they felt, I think, without, without any power. And then, and then and the shareholders were kind of walled off, not really knowing what they could do about this. And once you create this conversation and the shareholder quote finds their voice, um, it got really easy. I mean, once the directors knew what the share, how frustrated the shareholders were and they could essentially act on behalf of the shareholders, they did. Um, so it's nothing more than that. Now the company was run by a monopolist of sorts. And so he was not customer friendly. It's like the first ESG I've ever seen. The CEO was customer unfriendly, employee unfriendly and, and planet unfriendly. And with the flip of a switch, Sacha came in and he put customer first, employee first. And of course, you know, with his, his net zero program, put, put the planet right up there as well. Um, and, you know, now, now that, it's, you know, just w with the flip of the switch, the company has prospered. I know you, you can't talk about future positions and I know I don't want you to talk about, you know, where the puck is going for Value Act as much as I want you to talk about the components or the DNA of what you're looking for in a future sizable stake like the one you made in Microsoft. So what are the components that you think about? I mean, it went from financial engineering in the, in the early to mid 2000s because balance sheets were lazy, cost structures were lazy. You hadn't consolidated industries as much. Um, so I'm your classic profit maximizer during those years um, and uh, with a longer term focus, but you know, that was the opportunity. By 2013, 2014, um, that, was, that stuff was less easy. There were every, hedge funds were all activists in their own right and people were self-actuating, companies were self-actuating on the cost structure and their balance sheet and interest rates were low. And so they, they made sure they, they got debt in the balance sheet. You know, the, uh, the next, I would call it the next phase of my time at Value Act 2013 to, to 17, we started to transition to, to business model change, um, which is a little harder. Um, you know, Adobe was one where we really advocated for a move from a license uh, upgrade business to a subscription business. And, and it was hard for them because it was gonna hurt the earnings for two or three years but it's a better business uh, in terms of the way uh, customers are onboarded and, and you can put it in the cloud and you can watch how they use, use the product and you can, you can grow your audience because you're, it's $30 a month instead of 3000 for a license. Um, and and that, that's a kind of a different 
in, in Microsoft was that too. We basically had to unhook the productivity suite from the Windows operating system because operating systems over time will be free um, instead of keeping them attached. Um, so you were taking down Excel and, and, and Outlook as you stuck to the Windows model. So there, there's, there, there's, and that's a, that's really fun because you're changing industries and that's to a certain extent what we're doing at Inclusive Capital. We're trying to be leaders in industry change around business models. So Jeff, jumping in, uh, in 2017, you were at uh, Value Act for 17 years as a sole portfolio manager and walking the walk that you talked about in terms of company culture, you decided to turn the flagship fund over to your handpicked successor you started the Spring Fund, which is now part of Inclusive Capital, which is your new firm. What prompted you to make that change and to inform uh, to form Inclusive Capital? To, to reverse the harm I had done as a profit maximizer. Uh, I didn't like the neighborhood uh, that I was in. Uh, I think we did it. We do it differently. Um, um, our, our time horizon is three to five years. We get paid on three to five year performance, not one year performance. But the, the, the ability to get the long-term back for companies was really concerning for me. And I, I, the more I, I studied um, these new constraints, natural and social capital, you know, we have a planet that's pushing back. We have no water in California, so how are we gonna grow tomatoes, you know, for instance? Um, we have no middle class in our country, so how are we gonna get fair wage jobs, you know, um, um, back? So, so um, uh, for me, this idea of environmental and social investing, which is less share repurchase and more long-term investments to make your company sustainable and earn a premium was the new value lever. I mean, that's the way I saw it. That's the way I do see it. And so we've had other impact investors on this show and at our conferences and for them, Obviously, the social and environmental component is very important, but a lot of them also make the distinction that investing with these factors in mind actually is going to help drive returns into the future. Could you tell us how, you know, thinking about the environment, thinking about societal impact, you think, uh, if you do think this will help drive returns in the future? I mean, when you think about, Anthony will get this, when you think about value investing, whether it's with a shareholder activist hat or an environmental social activist hat, the, um, the stock price is the, is the catalyst. Um, the stock, when the stock price is low, it creates the pressure for change. It also creates the risk, risk reward as a new investor in the company. Um, I, I guess over the last three years, the higher the stock price, the higher it goes. So value investing has been more difficult. But generally speaking, since I have all my own money in the fund, I prefer to buy stocks that are lowly priced rather than high price. And so that during the shareholder activist run, um, the, the financial metric is typically the, the, uh, the metric that people are watching to cause a low stock price. It's the margins are half their industry competitors, you know, um, they have a portfolio that doesn't make sense, whatever it may be, and you break it up or you skip the company sold or you fix the margin. You know, um, in, this new, in this new world where we have these new constraints, you're starting to see externalities separate and apart from financial metrics impact stock prices. You know, when you look at big oil, for instance, in 2019, their returns were pretty darn good. Um, these were not bad years, but the stocks were already hitting 30 year lows. So you, you, know, you can see that the, the license to operate was starting to impact the stock price. And, and to me, that's the new lever um, because if I can go in there and change their capital allocation process um, and use what I think would be probably pretty stable hydrocarbon cash flows for a number of years, just because of the demand, demand supply situation we have today where you're in a disinvestment mode, an age of austerity, so to speak, there is a big opportunity to make a, a, a stock price that's at an all time low with a probably predictable cash flow over the next 10 or 15 years, a very different company. Um, that's, a, that's an idiosyncratic return I wanna go get. In, at very high levels, I think the carbon ha is a liability today, but the carbon creates 
an opportunity, I think, to turn it into an asset if you're carbon emitting to reduce or avoid it. And because there's a price signal for carbon, I think there's a whole new investment opportunity for these mature businesses. And, and that's a whole different way of thinking about it. You know, the ESG world screens carbon out. And I, I go find carbon because I think I can find a new, a new investment opportunity around reducing it since carbon is going to get an explicit price over the next five or 10 years. Makes sense. Jeff, what, what are your most exciting investment themes right now? What do you think of market indices and their current levels? Um, it's, I mean, you have 3 million indices and 40,000 stocks. You have 60,000 ESG ETFs and 40,000 stocks. So you've gone passive, as you said, to open this largely. And those that have big investments in ESG ETFs or even the S&P 500 got the honor of owning Tesla for 6% of their portfolio at a $650 billion market value. Um, that's a lot of risk, man. Uh, so there, there's, there's, there's tremendous risk being taken with very little acknowledgement of, uh, of it. And the ESG uh, passive flows are creating ESG darlings that are um, uh, fraught with risk. And, but it, I don't mind it because, you know, if Nextera trades at 35 times earnings and I'm on the board of AES and we trade at 12 times earnings, you know, we're, we look like, we look like them. We're a power producer and we own some utilities. Uh, what if I can make AES look like Nextera? You know, I got 20 PE points to go grab um, and get it, get it off the screen and into portfolios that are, you know, getting funds flow. So it is a, it is a very, uh, it, it, is a, it is a disorienting time. I see my value guys retiring just like they did in 2000. You know, we saw a number of retirements in 2000, Julian Robertson and others who said, I don't get it. And so you've got that same thing going on now. That's, a, that's typically a good sign for some sort of uh, inflection. Now, I remember when Julian uh, gave up the goose. You, you may not remember this. Maybe you do. He was short US Air. And it yeah. was coming up in his face and he says, okay, I'm done with this. And he bought all that great land in New Zealand. Uh, and then of course, uh, uh, after he left, US Air crashed. It was sort of uh, you know, ominous that uh, he had gotten the things right from a fundamental basis, but sometimes the markets go awry. Um, both you and your father have been very involved donors. Uh, you don't simply write checks, but you're actually active in these non for profit organizations. Uh, was he an influence on you in that regard? You know, he, he, you can't take it with you. Uh, and he put himself on a glide path to zero. I mean, by, by the way, I need to interrupt Jeff because my kids keep telling me that I can take it with me because they don't want me to spend it. Okay. Just so you know, okay. There's yeah. a lot of influence from these, these millennials that put a lot of pressure on us old men, but go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, we, maybe we screw that up if we if we listen to it. we should we should get it out of that estate. Um, uh, but but he, that's 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 his. You know, he's when I started getting a paycheck from Fidelity, uh, he, he requires me to give ten percent of my money away, and that's hard to do when you're just making your way, getting your first paycheck, and you're with your you have you know young kids with your wife making your way, but. But uh, I, you do that, you know, I remember he, he's like, what are you, where are you going to give it this year? And I was like, I'm going to give it to, you know, PBS because the kids are watching Sesame Street. And he's like, what? You better do some work on, work, you know, where you're going to ha you know, have impact on, on, uh, on, on, on certain nonprofits and allocate your time as well as your money. So, um, you know, that, that stays with me. We have a foundation attached to inclusive capital and we're trying to, trying to marry phil philanthropy markets and policy because there's these, these things that fall through the cracks you know and education affordable housing um and so uh to, to attach it to my business rather rather than it be this sideshow is also a kind of a new thing for me for whatever reason people invest aggressively and do harm without paying attention to 
to what they own and then they try to fix the harm they did with their donations and it's a net zero sort of outcome, you know? So everybody should think about what they own and are they investing in, so that their donations don't offset their, 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 their investment problems. Well said. Jeff, I want to jump back in here because uh, I know you've been innovating not just around investment strategy, but also around fund structure. Could you tell us how you're innovating around fund structure uh, with Inclusive? We, we did go to three to five year lockups and three to five year payouts at ValueWack. So we don't get paid until the end of five years. Your money compounds, compounds, compounds. And at the mark to market at five years, we move, you know, the, the promote uh, if there is a, uh, a profit from the LP to the GP. But I thought that was uh, a good innovation because it aligns our, our LP's interests with our time horizon. Um, the, uh, the, the innovation at Inclusive is that we, that we have this flex capital. So one of the problems with, with uh, hedge funds is you, you, know, you sell Microsoft at a $4 billion profit, and then, and then how do you recreate a $4 billion idea? So you either return the capital and never get it back, it seems, or you sit on cash um, and you get paid a management fee for that. Um, so we, we designed this flex capital. Um, we get the it sits on the side and we can draw it and then we can return it. It's committed, but there's no fees on that, on that piece of the, and that's half the asset base that we're trying to raise for the new firm. Um, so it just seems much more, much, it's a, it's more like, it's a, it's a, it's like private equity, but it's a, but we're dealing with public companies and we don't want to carry all this cash, but we don't want to charge for it. Um, but we don't want to, the co-invest model is not interesting to me because you pass the hat and investors say yes or no. And they hired me for a reason. They like my ideas. So I should be able to just draw it when I want it rather than ask them if I can use it. So that's the innovation, if it makes sense. Right. Uh, makes a lot of sense. I want to dive back into the question about investment themes. So I'm going to editorialize a little bit here. I think there's, there's different types of ESG. There's the type of ESG that's going through the motions ESG, and there's the type of ESG that's really driving a lot of change. I know you're focused on the latter as opposed to the optics around it. Uh, you know, I, I don't think that you need the money. You really want to drive social change and environmental change here. So what are the, the themes that you think right now are, are most exciting in terms of both their return profile uh, and in terms of their potential societal and environmental uh, benefit? And, and how are you deploying capital into those types of names? Um, it turns out the, it turns out the value, value is kind of an, a moving thing, you know, in the early 2000s, there was a lot of value in software because we came off this bubble, a uh, tech bubble, and many people had bought all the software, software licenses they, they, they needed for a period of time. My first new investment was Gartner Group post the crash. And Gartner was selling kind of vendor ratings to companies that was like six bucks a share down from 40. Um, so tech, tech and software and free cash flow asset like businesses were quite available and interesting. But, you know, now we are 20 years later and that whole asset light world, that digital economy, especially for, with COVID and work from home is in low interest rates has, has revalued to, you know, and it's very crowded to, to um, the 50 multiples. And where we see the value is in, is in the real economy. You know, the people that are growing the food, people that are actually, you know, make producing the energy that moves, moves, uh, moves cars and trucks and, and, and heats homes. Um, the, the, uh, the material, the materials that are required to, to, to get product to market, you know, you, you can, you can do your DoorDash or, order and DoorDash can be valued at $60 billion, but somehow it's got to get to you. And, and for whatever reason, asset intensive, capital intensive companies that are doing the real stuff are, are for sale. So my, the value and the value investor in me is looking at capital intensive businesses, which I haven't really done that much of until recently. Um, uh, the cool thing is that, that those companies um, that need to attract capital are starting, are starting to do so. I mean, we see the SPAC pipe world really is, is moving 
capital into, into balance sheet oriented businesses to address some of these big problems. Like, can we grow our food locally? We, we have a controlled environment agriculture company that just went public this week called App Harvest. Um, you know, the hydrogen economy is being launched. Uh, the EV economy is being launched by, by SPAC pipes. So there's a lot of speculation, but these are largely companies that would not be otherwise venture capital funded. Um, and now, now we're accessing long-term money like Fidelity and Norges Bank to, to execute on this stuff. So that, you know, the legacy companies that have the CapEx, that have the workforce, that have the global footprint, that do project management well, and then these, new, these newer companies that um, are kind of running to the goal as pure plays, that's how we're building our portfolio, you know, to, to manage the risk. We're, we're finding founders that need big balance sheets, we're getting them the money, and we're working with the big companies to access their capital to do some of the same stuff. That's great. I want to elaborate on uh, your carbon theme that you talked about, which I think is, is super interesting. So we did our most recent SALT conference in Abu Dhabi. We spend a lot of time in the region, in Saudi, uh, in Kuwait, uh, in the UAE. And I find it fascinating how aggressively those countries are investing in technologies that are disrupting their own sources of revenue. So, you know, in the UAE, uh, for example, they're investing heavily in sustainable energy. And they're, they're trying to innovate around carbon in addition to diversifying their economies. I know that you travel around the world and talk to all types of investors, including investors in the Middle East. What's your experience in talking to them about how they're thinking about sustainability and, uh, and sort of innovating around their carbon-based businesses? I mean, I'm, I'm on the AES board and we have a big business in Chile and we have a ton of free energy in the middle of the day in Chile because there's been a bunch of uh, solar solar energy build out and what can you do with that you know you could green ammonia is a fascinating idea um it, if you take the the traditional fertilizer company you know like cf industries in north north america uh it it trades at eight times EBITDA because they're making carbon heavy fertilizer uh and they don't have a, a growth opportunity because you don't want to do a greenfield and fertilizer grow slowly and you'll upset your, your local market. So what do you do? You buy shares back. So you're buying shares back in a no growth business. It's always going to trade at eight times because you know, you don't, you're not really creating value if you're buying shares back in a no growth business. So, so what do you do? Well, it turns out that they, they emit 18 million tons of carbon. They sit on in Louisiana with their biggest plant, which sits on aquifers that could be filled up with carbon. So to move that bunch of capital into carbon capture um, and watch carbon prices go to 40, 50, 60, 70 dollars, uh, they could generate a billion dollars, you know, that's 50 dollars times 18. They could generate a billion dollars of EBITDA with new investment, which wasn't even available to them and, until carbon. So green ammonia trades at 700 dollars a ton, you know, gray ammonia, you know, which is sourced from gas, trades at 300 dollars a ton. So there are, there is a price signal. It's just a very small market, but farmers are asking for carbon free fertilizer. Um, you know, uh, increasingly you could do something with, with maritime shipping, um, which is what I think they're looking at in Chile to, to change geopolitics away from Singapore, you know, Los Angeles and Rotterdam and have, can have new ports that can fill up boats with green ammonia as, as a transport fuel. I mean, that, this is this is a whole new way of thinking about a fertilizer company. All right. And I know Elon Musk, I don't know if you've studied this. It sounds like you have because you're so involved around carbon, but he announced a prize for somebody who comes up with a new, novel, innovative carbon capture solution. Are there any emerging technologies in that space that you think uh, could be really exciting? I mean, carbon is such a small part of the atmosphere. Uh, direct air capture is... I'm rooting for him. Believe me, I'm rooting, I'm rooting for him. That changes everything. Um, but 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 if you think about the way everything's interconnected, I mean, um, to use forestry to capture carbon, um, um, to 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 put it in the ground, obviously, with in these aquifers that have been emptied out, um, that's a business. Um, 
I think there's going to be a tremendous amount of innovation around, around, um, around carbon capture. We're involved in a biomass company that grows, that, that takes tree waste in the southeastern United States and makes a wood pellet out of it and ships it to coal plants all over the world to decarbonize coal. And that looks like, to me, that looks like a kind of a, a transition, uh, a transition um, business until we get hydrogen up and running to move renewables to long duration storage, which is probably 2040, 2035. But what if we can put like Drax, our customer in the UK is, 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 uh, is putting the carbon from the plant that burned wood pellets into the, into the, into the ground. And all of a sudden we have a, a forest that's growing, it's capturing more carbon and the carbon that we're burning when we make, make the energy goes into the ground. We're, we've got a net sink business. That's a really cool idea. Um, so that, you know, the, there's a the carbon, carbon pricing, explicit or implicit, voluntary or involuntary is what we need to give us that signal to spend the money and it's happening. So my, my last question is from a public policy perspective, we have smart people in the private sector like yourself who are driving capital and, and driving change in these areas that we desperately need it from a public policy perspective. What can we do uh, to incentivize investment in these areas and to drive change and accelerate change? You need to get, you need to get these companies to put the money behind it. Um, and, you know, big oil, for instance, they've been obfuscating or fighting all of this stuff around, around carbon pricing um, because they thought it was an extra cost. But if they start to think the way I'm thinking and they start to advocate for this stuff, then all of a sudden the fight turns into, um, you know, a back scratch um, because it, it, it generates returns. It becomes a competitive advantage if you're putting money behind these new solutions that are getting rewarded with subsidies or in fact, they're, they're going to be a, a penalty if you don't, if you don't address and reduce. So the, the policy has been slow, but the companies have been fighting it. If we get the companies to put the money behind it, then policy will become easy, uh, which All is right, where so we started. We've got to subdue the companies and, and really force their hand in terms of investing in these areas. Yeah, which is where, exactly where we started, which is if I can get companies to invest more, not less, uh, an oil company should never do a share purchase from here. They need to reallocate their hydrocarbons to, to these other capital intensive carbon carbon avoiding technologies um, because there's a return attached to it, then policy will just fall right into place. You, you can't, you know, the, this idea that, you know, everybody should own an EV by 2035 in California, it makes Gavin Newsom look great, but the economics aren't there. So you gotta give me some economics. You gotta give the utility the ability to invest in an EV infrastructure so I don't have range anxiety, you know, or you gotta get, you gotta, you gotta do something with, with you, you know, you gotta, the, the, the vehicle is way too expensive for middle America. So, the, the, right. it just, you know, Gavin's going to be long gone, just like a CEO is going to be long gone if they're throwing out these fancy targets in 2035. Um, we need economics to fall in place to create the incentives uh, for it to happen. We can't just do, do it by eat it. Yep. Uh, that's something that we believe in very heavily is trying to create incentives that drive capital in areas and not try to dictate outcomes from a top-down level. It's right. much more effective. But Jeff, thanks so much for joining us. Anthony, you have a final word for Jeff before we let him go. This has been a fascinating yeah, I conversation. I just want to congratulate you on your career. Uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to your uh, exemplary investment results ahead. And uh, John and I are very jealous of your suntan. I just had to get that in there. Before That's the sun. The sun rises in the east. No, right? no, no. no. <laughs> you're, you're, you're looking fit and tan, and I'm sitting here in 24 inches of melting snow. So I just have to let you know I'm a little bummed out it, about that. It is, 60, it is 62. You're right. You're right. Jeff, he's, he's jealous because he yeah. hadn't, because of COVID, he hasn't been able to get his, his normal spray tan. So he's feeling <laughs> very... Uh, well, it's not, yeah, not only right. that, I have like copper wire growing out of my ears now because I've been living in my basement. But other than that, I'm doing fine, Jeff. You you continue to enjoy that California sunshine. All right, man. And, uh, and, congratu you. and congratulations on everything. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks for having me. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in to today's Salt Talk with Jeff Ubbin, uh, formerly of Value Act, where he made uh, his name as well as at Fidelity, and now at Inclusive Capital or NCAP. It's great to see talented investors like Jeff 
uh, turning their attention almost exclusively to social and environmental impacts and how you can drive capital to create uh, better outcomes for our society and for our planet. Uh, just a reminder, if you missed any of this talk or any of our previous talks, you can access our entire archive as well as sign up for any future SALT talks at salt.org backslash talks. Uh, please spread the word about these talks, especially ones like this. We, we love when people spread the word about our environmental and social impact SALT talks because we think it's important to educate people and continue to drive capital uh, into those types of solutions. So please spread the word. We're on social media. Please follow us there and retweet us and share all of our material. Uh, we're on YouTube. Our channel posts all these episodes. Uh, we're up to, I think, more than 12,000 subscribers today. So it's been gratifying to see that growth as we pivoted to a digital model uh, during the pandemic. We're also on Facebook. We're on Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And on behalf of the entire SALT team, this is John Darcy signing off from SALT Talks for today. Uh, we hope to see you back here soon.